from from up there in uh, the Reno area, Nevada area. Welcome, Will, and and all kinds of good stuff. So nice, nice to see some new faces as well as don't take this the wrong way. The usual old faces. Um, <laughs> it's appropriate for this, though. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And um, so what we'll start with is uh, you know uh, many of you have heard Dan speak before, especially if you joined us last year when he gave the talk. But he's a uh, not only a very well-known speaker and a, and a good friend, but uh, Dan talks about safety issues and all kinds of great stuff. He is the former president of the Divers Alert Network, also known as Dan. So it was always tough when you said, I need to call Dan. And were you talking about the organization or were you talking about the individual? And sometimes it was even, even both. Um, but at any rate, Dan um, speaks at many, many conferences, always attracts a good audience and always gives a good talk. So with all kinds of pressure like that, <laughs> Mr. Orr, the floor is yours. Well, I appreciate we'll do it. We'll guys like we normally do, questions and answers at the end. Yeah, please. Yeah, if you could just hold your questions till the end, I'll stay on as long as everybody has a question. Um, and as uh, Ken was saying, I do a number of presentations, and this is actually one of one, one that's closest to my heart because being an older diver myself, uh, I have to look at all these issues whenever I, whenever I dive. And as, hold on, make sure we're getting... There we go. Um, as an older diver, in fact, I'm uh, 74. I will be turning 75 by this coming summer. Uh, and I still do quite a bit of diving. And since turning 70, I've made dives in the Antarctic, um, the Arctic part of Greenland, uh, Argentina, uh, the Philippines, Guadalupe Island, Mexico, which I do every year. I do at least two trips there every year. Uh, Socorro, which is also in Mexico and Key Largo and uh, actually a number of other places. So I do have quite a few dive trips actually scheduled for this year if they do go. Uh, and that's really kind of up in the air. In fact, I was supposed to go to Antarctica in uh, the 29th of this month, but I just uh, found out today that the trips have been canceled due to COVID. So, uh, you know, we're all dealing with those issues when we're involved in travel of any kind. Uh, age is not a particularly interesting subject. Uh, anyone can get old. All you have to do is live long enough. That's a quote from Groucho Marx. And age, of course, should not be a barrier to living our dreams. And for a lot of us, including me, being a diver is one of my dreams. And I like to uh, take advantage of any opportunity to dive that I possibly can. Uh, let's look at some age-related data. Um, between the year, and this comes from the World Health Organization, uh, between the years 2000 and 2050, the number of people uh, age 60 and over is expected to double. And by 2050, uh, about 20% or one in five people will be 60 years old or older. And if you look around, and a lot of us uh, do a lot of diving, if you look around at the people that you dive with, uh, it's generally a reflection of yourself. Uh, so when you start looking at um, the dive active diving population, they're generally older. Uh, and that's one reason a couple of years ago, I wrote an article called The Ageless Diver for uh, Dive Center Business Magazine, the people that publish um, the um, dive training magazine. And uh, it was actually for the dive stores to let the dive stores and so, sort of let the industry know there's a huge market out there that are of these older people, the baby boomers who created the industry and have kept it going for all these years. It's a huge market because for one thing, we have time on our hands generally, we have resources and we certainly have the interest uh, to, to go diving. So it's a, it's a great population to uh, kind of help uh, the industry. And unfortunately, the industry hasn't taken that seriously in most cases. They keep trying to get old, younger people, and younger people, of course, are the lifeblood of the future of the sport. But still, there are older people out there who have a lot of resources and can really help the industry out. So when you look at um, the age distribution, and it's really what I was just talking about, that um, the majority of active divers in the diving population uh, are over 40. And in fact, this was something that was done by scuba.com, the blog spot uh, a couple of years ago. And it said that almost 66% or about two thirds of the active diving population were the older divers older than 40. So let's talk about aging. Uh, by definition, it's the process of becoming older uh, a process that is genetically determined, you have no control over that, uh, and it is environmentally modulated. And that is something where we do have some level of control. And we'll talk about the, that here in just a moment. Uh, by definition, there is something called successful aging. That's really what we want. 
uh, we want to be able to age successfully, uh, and that is the absence of any sort of disability, any depressive symptoms we may have, uh, any cognitive impairment, uh, any respiratory difficulties, and any uh, chronic diseases that would impact our ability to enjoy our sport. Uh, and how to age successfully? And that is to stay social because diving is and always has been a very social activity and groups like this, of course, kind of keep that social activity going, uh, keep moving and keep diving. And that's one way to be able to continue uh, to enjoy uh, life and enjoy the sport, keep thinking uh, and eat the right food. So in other words, be healthy, think healthy and dive healthy. There was something that was published in the New Journal, Journal, excuse me, New England Journal of Medicine, and that was uh, that the most productive years, the third most productive years uh, in the population is between 50 and 60. The second most productive years were between 70 and 80, and the most productive years was between 60 and 70. Uh, so just because you are older, it doesn't mean that you aren't going to be productive You've probably been productive and continue to be productive in your career, um, but it doesn't mean you're not going to be productive uh, in the sport you so dearly enjoy. So for older divers, diving is relatively safe, and safety can be improved by taking a cautious and calculated approach to risk assessment and risk mitigation. So this really applies to everybody, not just older divers, uh, but you want to be safe, and safety can be improved by taking those cautious and calculated approaches. But the problem is we deal with data. And uh, this is data from the British Subaco Club. And they look at their active diving population and their membership. And divers who were over 50 in their membership uh, constituted about 16% of their diving population. That same group uh, comprised about a third of all of the diving accidents they have in their records and about 50% of the fatalities. So that would imply, uh, and not necessarily correctly so, but imply uh, that there is an issue related to age and the propensity of diving accidents or fatalities. When you look at uh, the database, the DAN database, and you look at uh, diving fatalities between men and women uh, per 100,000 divers, it does, again, appear as though uh, it's on an upward trend and there may be some relationship with, between age and uh, injuries and fatalities. But of course, that can be skewed by the fact that the majority of the acting diving population is indeed uh, older people, uh, and therefore they're likely to be represented, overrepresented in the accident database. Now, also, you need to be aware of the fact that there are some issues related to age. Uh, and just about every time I do a presentation on aging and diving, uh, there is a question about different places around the world where there is some perception that there is a restriction simply based upon age. Uh, and the last time I did a presentation on aging and diving, somebody said that they had heard that it's Silfra, the crack, which is in Iceland. That's where the two tectonic plates come together and you can put your hand on the North American and the uh, European uh, tectonic plates at the same time. But they were told that uh, divers over 60 simply could not dive uh, in Silfra. So I called the dive center there and they did tell me that Every diver, that's every diver, regardless of age, whether you're a diver or a snorkeler, have to complete a diving history medical statement. But those who are over 60 have to have that statement approved by a physician. Doesn't mean you can't dive. You simply have to have that medical form signed by a physician. So let's talk about age itself and defining age. So there are three different types of age that we'll talk about. One is a chronological age, which is your actual age by your birth date. The other is, um, well, and uh, when you talk about your birth date, of course, we talk about life expectancy. And uh, 100 years ago, it was 53.6 years for men and 54.6 years for women. Life expectancy uh, for those born in 2021, 76 years for men and 81 years for women. The next type of aging is the physiological age. And that is based on your physical fitness, uh, your health status, your cognitive function, and then there's psychological age, and psychological age is simply where you consider yourself to be old, uh, either younger or older. It all depends on how you feel about yourself, and that is a self-chosen set of attitudes, perceptions, and expectations. And those are things you indeed can control. Going back for a minute to physiological age, the things listed here are things you can control. You can control your level of fitness. You can, can, can have some control over your health status, and you ha can have some control over your cognitive function. 
So that psychological age, again, is old self-chosen set of attitudes, perceptions, and expectations. And then, of course, you have groups like the AARP that you would think their sole purpose in to be in existence is to make you feel old. So when you are approaching the age of 50, all of a sudden you're inundated by all sorts of letters and emails and all kinds of materials uh, telling you that you're old and you should belong to the AARP. <laughs> and I'd like to see someday a diver being on the cover of the AARP. It hasn't happened yet, but I would love to see that. And there was an article in the AARP that once said that they categorize people uh, into three different categories, the young old, people who were 60 to 69, middle old, people who were 70 to 79, and old old, <laughs> and pe those are people who are 80 years and older. And it makes absolutely no sense to me to categorize people um, based upon simply their age group. Uh, so to me, that's kind of ridiculous. And I love this quote uh, from Satchel Page: how old would you be if you didn't know how old you are? So if you didn't know the year you were born and you didn't know your chronological age, I would guess that almost all of us would think we're 10 or 15 or 20 years younger than we really are. It's kind of like uh, Crocodile Dundee. When they asked Mick when he was born, he said in the summertime. Uh, so there are a lot of people, including myself, that pay no attention whatsoever to the age. We just want to make sure that we're healthy and continue to enjoy life and continue to enjoy the sport that we love. But there are some facts of life we have to deal with. So one of those has to do with organs and your organs begin to lose function. And this is a very general statement. It does not apply the same way to everybody because it all depends upon a lot of those psychological and physiological age issues we talked about before. But for the average population, the average individual, most organs begin to lose function at about 1% a year beginning around the age of 30. The majority of those changes, however, don't take place or may not take place until after and sometimes well after the age of 70. And again, that's just a general statement that has to do with changes within your body. And these changes may affect performance. But again, they affect performance differently in different people based upon your psychological age, based upon your physiological age. I happened to be on a dive trip. This was actually a dive trip to Guadalupe uh, with Stan Waterman when he was celebrating his 90th uh, birthday. And it was kind of like a rock band because he was celebrating his 90th birthday for the entire year. <laughs> and he was diving all over and, and celebrating his birthday with different groups in different parts of the diving world. But he was still very active and still enjoyed the sport of diving. Now, judgment and reasoning can and I emphasize can improve with age. And again, that's a very general statement. It all depends upon the people. I mean, we know some people who are very young or some people who are middle age or some people even older than we are uh, who have no reasoning ability at all. <laughs> uh, but judgment and reasoning can improve with age. And you can compensate for decrements that you have. So if you consider the fact that, and we'll talk about all these as we go through, if you consider the fact that there are some tools that you may need uh, to be able to enjoy life, uh, and that would include things, for example, like having to wear glasses or other things. If you, if you think about those decrements, you can, as the Marine Corps talks about dealing with, of course, their, their role in life, is you can adapt, overcome, and improvise. So first of all, you have to recognize that you have some sort of impairment uh, or decrement. And then once you identify that, then you simply find a tool or a way to be able to compensate for that so you can still enjoy the sport that you do. Now, as far as facts of life, again, are concerned, uh, there is an increased potential for chronic medical issues. That really has to do with the fact that your, um, your system is not as robust uh, as it would be when you're younger uh, and your immune system is not as robust and therefore you have to generally deal with some chronic medical issues uh, as you grow older. Uh, and I don't feel like I'm getting older. It's more like my warranty has expired and my parts are wearing out. So I expect any day to get a phone call telling me that I need to get my warranty renewed because <laughs> we all get those phone calls. Um, and also when you think about those things and parts wearing out, just about everybody I know that I dive actively with uh, has had some part replaced uh, because those parts are wearing out as you get older. And when I looked up Things, for example, like joint replacement on the internet, this photo popped up, which was an advertisement for uh, a medical facility that uh, specialized in orthopedics and joint replacement. And the person pictured there was a scuba diver. 
So there are a lot of divers who get joint replacement. I actually had my knee replaced a couple of years ago, uh, and that has not stopped me from doing the things that I enjoy doing. Uh, I, I'm not quite as limber in that knee as I was when I was younger, um, but that doesn't stop me from diving. I simply take a slower, more cautious uh, approach to the sport. And also I've dealt with other things, for example, like cancer. And I had uh, prostate cancer a number of years ago uh, and I had to go through 34 radiation treatments as well as surgery. And so I asked on the last treatment, radiation therapy treatment, if I could put my diving gear on and lay on the table to, to be photographed so I could show people that even cancer was not gonna keep me from doing what I love to do. And then I posted that on my Facebook page and the lady on the right-hand side was finishing her last chemotherapy session. And she did the same thing to show people that nothing is gonna stop us from doing what we enjoy doing. So let's talk about different organ systems. Let's talk about, in this case, the muscles and the skeleton. And again, these are all facts of life that we have to deal with. Uh, when you grow older, uh, you have decreased strength and mobility. That is a fact of life. You have decreased flexibility and joint range of motion. Now, to what extent really all depends upon your fitness level and uh, your physiological age. Uh, so again, it doesn't apply the same way to everybody, uh, but these are things we have to deal with in some mechanism or so, some way or another. Also increased susceptibility to injury and longer recovery time. Uh, that photo over on the right-hand side was actually, I was on a liveaboard board a few years ago and um, they had just washed all the wetsuits off and were dragging them up the ladder to the left there. And they'd washed the wetsuits off in Fabuloso, which is a very slippery, foamy detergent. And it made those steps very, very slippery. And I took one step on the top of that ladder and fell all the way down to the deck. And in the process, broke a couple of fingers and gashed my elbow a little bit. And luckily, the crew had just finished their day and first aid program. And they were Johnny on the spot there to help me uh, and took care of me without any problem whatsoever. But it did take me a while to, to heal and to recover uh, from that injury. And Dan, how many free yes. trips did you get out of that fall? <laughs> Actually, I got none. <laughs> uh, you need a better lawyer. Yeah, I know I do. <laughs> but the medical facility that was on shore that he took me to also was the only chamber on the island. So um, somebody happened to see me there and they called the office and they called and said, you know, we're ready to medevac you out. And I said, no, 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 no. It's just, a, I'm not bent. <laughs> it's just a, just a couple of broken fingers and a cut. So uh, uh, they were ready to help me out and evacuate me out of there, which I didn't really need. Also, increased muscle stiffness after activity is a fact of life. And whether you're diving or not, those are things you know you have to deal with. You're doing a lot of physical activity. You're really sore the next day. So diving considerations. You have to think about the fact that you have to move from place to place uh, in, a, in a diving situation. So if you're on a boat, you have to put your gear together where it is. You have to get up and you have to move to the entry point. Uh, and then once you're back on the boat, you have to get back to where your equipment is. Same way on shore, you have to put your gear together, walk over to the entry point. So you do have to move from one place to the next. You have to be able to physically do that without any difficulty. You have to have a, a good range of motion to lift and don and doff your equipment because you have to put your equipment on. Even though you get some assistance from your partner, you still have to do a lot of that yourself. Um, also, you have to enter and exit the water, as we talked about before, and you have to climb up and down a ladder, which is uh, an issue. And sometimes the ladders can be kind of challenging. And I want to point out something in this photo. I mean, even though I, I do talk a lot about diving safety, I can't let this photo go because you have this guy back in the back who's way too close to the person in front of him. If that person were to fall off the ladder, they'd land right on him. Uh, and the other thing is the person climbing up the ladder should have their regulator in their mouth because if they were to fall back in the water, uh, they'd struggle trying to find that regulator to keep from drowning. So uh, those are things you need to do. It has nothing to do with aging, but I couldn't let that picture go without making a comment. Uh, also mobility in the water. So you have to be able to move from place to place. And sometimes you have to deal with currents and surge and wave action, and a lot of other things. So you have to be able to physically deal with those things. You don't have to do it quickly. And one thing we'll talk about is you don't have to keep up with everybody else, uh, but you and your partner should talk about it to make sure that you move at a pace that's comfortable for both of you. So diving consideration deficits may be mitigated uh, with exercises to maintain aerobic capacity. I don't recommend jogging with fins on, but uh, you need to make sure that if you're going to exercise, uh, you need to have some level of aerobic capacity. Uh, muscle strength for being able to carry your equipment around. I wouldn't recommend doing it this way. Uh, and joint flexibility, because you do have to be somewhat flexible. Uh, and this is this photo is one of my favorite photos. I was actually diving uh, with uh, Dr. Jose Jones. Dr. Jose Jones is the co-founder of the National Association of Black Scuba Divers. 
And uh, Dr. Jones, you can see back in the background, is in the perfect lotus position. And you can see in the foreground that I'm not. <laughs> and he, at the time this picture was taken, I think he was probably in his mid to upper 70s. Uh, and he was a lot more flexible than I have ever been. Uh, flexibility is indeed very important. And one of the side note, by the way, for those of you who know about the Nogi Award, Dr. Jones is receiving a Nogi Award uh, for Distinguished Service uh, this coming year. So what accommodations can be made if you have issues with the muscles and skeleton? Ask for help. If you're on a dive boat, you're paying those people to help you. Uh, if you are chartering that boat, if you are a guest on that boat, there are people there whose job it is to help you. So take advantage of that opportunity. Choose easier equipment configuration. So if you don't like the cylinders on your back, uh, then use side mounts where you can get in the water and attach them to you once you're in the water. And there is some equipment, in fact, at the recent DEMA show, there is some equipment, a cylinder system uh, that they say is a lot lighter than the traditional aluminum 80 or the steel 71.2. Uh, and so that may be something to consider when that becomes available as a product. It's not available now, though. Uh, also, take it slow and easy. Move at your pace. Don't make people, don't make yourself keep up with other people. So, in my opinion, I will never keep up with anybody. I want to make sure that I'm moving at a pace that's comfortable for me. My partner and I spend time before the dive talking about the fact that we want to move at a certain pace. So I don't want to exhaust myself and exhaust my breathing gas supply by trying to keep up with other people. Uh, so take it slow and easy uh, and don't be in a situation where you're always having to keep up with someone else. Uh, and also dive your experience. Your experience is extremely important because that will give you a comfort zone and an emotional comfort zone uh, where you're not stressed by the dive you're going to make. So dive your recent experience, not your certification card. I don't care what your certification card says. Uh, if it says you're an advanced diver or uh, an instructor or whatever, um, what's more important than anything is your experience level and your recent experience uh, and your skills. Uh, so don't just simply make sure that you are diving with uh, relative to your certification card. And just because it says an advanced diver doesn't mean you can always do those advanced dives. So let's talk about your heart and lungs. The heart becomes a less efficient pump. Now think about this relative to gas absorption and elimination or decompression sickness. So your heart becomes a less efficient pump. That So it's less efficient in circulating blood throughout your body. Uh, your maximum heart rate decreases. Uh, your vital and ventilatory capacity decreases. Now, again, think about that as far as ventilation and gas absorption and elimination is concerned. Your body requires more oxygen to do the same amount of work, uh, and that is the work of diving. You also have decreased tissue perfusion, fat stores, and metabolism. So again, uh, that affects your body's ability to absorb and eliminate gases uh, that are essential in preventing or reducing the likelihood of decompression sickness. Um, increased risk of hypothermia. So you may get colder faster. Uh, possible risk of decompression sickness, as we talked about before, because your body is impaired in its ability to absorb and eliminate gases, primarily eliminate gases as you're ascending back towards the surface at the end of the dive. And let's talk about fatalities. So 50% of the fatalities uh, from the DAN database uh, were from the over 40 age group. Approximately 34% of those were people that had cardiac related issues uh, during the dive. And 60% of those who had a cardiac related incident uh, were people that had signs and symptoms that they recognized were potentially cardiac related before the dive and people around them even recognized that they had some issue that could have been related to a cardiac problem, but they decided to dive anyway and died during the dive. So it makes no sense if you're not feeling well uh, to continue to dive or to uh, dive at all. So if you are in some way not feeling well, then it's best to uh, sit the dive out. Divers that are older than 50 in this database had a risk of a cardiac incident about 13 times greater than younger divers. So when we talk about cardiac issues related to diving, diving exposes divers' bodies to various stressors that could precipitate an arrhythmia. An arrhythmia, of course, a regular heartbeat, and that could then uh, contribute to a cardiac incident. So the major stressors that they deal with in diving are immersion, exposure to cold, increased work of breathing. 
And of course, we all know that's diving. Well, there really isn't anything you can do about immersion if you're really going to get in the water. But there are things you can do about exposure to cold and increased work of breathing. So exposure to cold, you can have the correct exposure suit. So a wetsuit or a dry suit. Um, and that can help you deal with exposure to cold. So that is an issue, you know, that could compromise your safety. Therefore, you develop a mechanism to be able to deal with that and reduce that risk by wearing the right exposure suit. Increased work of breathing, you can mitigate that risk by making sure your regulator is tuned properly. So it should be tuned on a regular basis to make sure uh, that there is no increased work of breathing, which can cause stress and also emotional stress. And this to me, I think is a big issue now, partly because you've had uh, a couple of years where people have not been diving regularly. And there are people who may not have been diving in the last two years, three years, four years, or even longer. And again, they may want to come back to the sport at the same level they perceive they were when they stopped diving. And, and at that point, they're, they haven't any recent experience. They're in a diving situation that itself could precipitate stress which then could precipitate an arrhythmia, which could result in a cardiac incident. So therefore, you need to make sure that if you're going to return to diving after an absence, uh, then you are uh, doing that uh, in a very thoughtful, a very cautious way. And, um, and there are a lot of papers around. In fact, I even wrote one that was in the uh, Dive Newswire that had to do with uh, return to diving, but cautiously. So let's talk about some of the signs and symptoms of a heart attack. Um, and you can see there just about anything and everything, jaw pain, toothache, nausea, shortness of breath, general little feeling, uh, a lot of different things. And about 25% of the people that had suffered a cardiac incident during a dive had no signs or symptoms whatsoever. They were totally unaware that they had a pending cardiac issue. So first aid for heart attack, remove the dive from the water. There's not a whole lot you can do for someone uh, in the water when they have a cardiac incident. Um, CPR if necessary, an automated external defibrillator if necessary. Uh, and there's an asterisk there because AEDs may not be available uh, at all dive sites and on all dive boats. They should be, uh, and we're getting better about that, uh, but there are places where you don't have that availability. And of course, whenever I go on a dive boat, I do check to make sure that they have a first aid kit, that they have an oxygen system that I check to make sure it's working properly. And I also check to see if they have an AED. And it may not be a bad idea to call ahead of time to make sure they have all of that uh, before you go on a dive vessel. And also contact the emergency medical services and divers alert network if necessary. So heart and lungs, diving considerations, decrease in performance as you age. You get tired faster as you age, slower to recover as you age. The photo here, I was diving actually in Curacao and uh, diving with Dr. Sylvia Earle, who uh, of course would never divulge her age. And she is, as far as we're all concerned, uh, ageless. So what accommodations can be made when you know these things about your heart and lungs? Ask for help. Again, there are people there that their sole job is to help you when you're on a dive vessel. Move at your own pace, not at someone else's pace. Conserve your energy because you want to make sure you make as many dives as you're comfortable with. Take frequent breaks if necessary. And again, select proper exposure protection. Uh, if you look at the picture in the upper right there, uh, that was a photo taken in 2018. I was diving in the Antarctic uh, on the Governor Norin, which is a whaling ship that caught fire in the early part of uh, the 1900s and they ran her ashore in order to uh, save the whale oil as well as uh, the passengers on board. And it's a, a very interesting wreck. Uh, and then also the thing down below says, don't be cold, be comfortable. And so you need to make sure again, you have the right exposure protection. So your nerves and senses, uh, you could <laughs> have improved judgment and reasoning ability. And that's a general statement because we all know there are some people who don't have improved judgment or even have no judgment or reasoning ability. Uh, decreased near object visual acuity. We all know that at some point in your life, your arms were no longer long enough to enable you to read. Uh, decreased low light and color perception. So you have some difficulty uh, in low light situations and being able to perceive certain colors. And of course, that isn't necessarily that important. Color is not that important when you're diving because we know that some of the colors are lost any with, anyway with depth. Uh, you also have decreased auditory acuity. Uh, the average person loses about 10 decibels of hearing ability for every decade of life. Uh, and also there are decrements in balance, balance spatial orientation and coordination. Uh, because there are, as you age, you do have some issues with balance and some issues with that spatial orientation and coordination. 
uh, and slower reaction time. So again, you are slower to react uh, to emergency situations. So diving considerations, harder to read your gauges, as we talked about before. Um, harder to hear and understand the pre-dive briefing, especially if the person giving the briefing, if English is not their primary language. Uh, sometimes they have a difficulty with certain phrases or certain vowels, uh, and therefore it may make it more difficult for you to understand what that person is saying. Uh, harder to negotiate dive sites because again, especially shore dive sites, uh, maybe uneven ground may make it difficult for you or being on a boat, maybe rocking back and forth may make it difficult for you to move around. Uh, increased difficulty in emergency situation because again, your response is slower than it would be if you were younger. And again, that's a very general statement. So what accommodation can be made, move closer. And again, ask questions during the pre-dive briefing. So if you have trouble hearing, then move closer so you can hear and understand what that person is saying. Review the dive plan with your partners before diving. So talk about the dive plan uh, for one thing, to make sure that you understood everything that was being said, and also to make sure that you and your partners are all on the same dive plan. I've been in situations or seen situations where divers are actually arguing underwater because they didn't communicate before the dive and we're on two separate dive plans. So possibly write the dive plan down in a slate if necessary so you can refer to it during the dive. Use prescription lenses if you have a hard time seeing uh, your gauges and be a more attentive buddy knowing that you may have some slowing in your reaction time to an emergency. So what accommodation can be made, assure a clear entry path, uh, be situationally aware, be aware, this is an important concept for all divers, be aware of the, um, the uh, your bottom time and the last bottom time, be aware of your depth uh, relative to your dive plan, uh, the consumption of your breathing gas. You should be communicating with your partners all the time about uh, breathing gas consumption because when you look at the Dan Fatality Database, uh, the number one triggering event for, event for many years uh, was running out of breathing gas underwater. Uh, in fact, in the research done in 2008, 41% of the triggering events were running out of breathing gas underwater. Uh, and your workload. So the more work you're doing underwater, the more gas you're consuming, and that could increase your risk for decompression sickness. Your, your buddy location, as well as the location, your location relative to your entry and exit point. So let's talk about your glands and skin, lower metabolic rate as you age, uh, reduced tolerance for cold, coupled with reduced tissue perfusion, which again uh, has to deal with your body's ability to rid itself of gases that have been accumulated during a dive. Decreased stress response and reaction time, as we talked about before. Again, slower reaction time if there's an emergency. So again, being a more attentive buddy, attentive buddy would be very, very important. Uh, altered drug and alcohol metabolism. Your skin atrophies uh, and you have a decreased tolerance for insults uh, from the sun. If you can see this cartoon there on the right, the guy is saying, oh, yay. Uh, ladies love the tan until they figure out it's actually rust. <laughs> Uh, your sweat glands shrink, reducing sweating and your body's ability to manage its internal temperature. Uh, diving considerations, again, poor tolerance to cold. Increased likelihood of dehydration. Decreased saliva production. So you have a hard time if you do spit into your mask, have a hard time creating enough saliva to be able to do that. Uh, increased likelihood of heat-related illnesses because, again, your body's having a hard time managing uh, its internal temperature. So what accommodations can be made? Correct exposure protection. When I dive in the Caribbean, the water temperature may be 80 degrees and I'm still wearing an exposure suit because 80 degrees is nearly 20 degrees colder than my body temperature. Uh, I made a dive in the Beagle Channel in Southern Argentina before I went to the Antarctic. And I did that dive because I wanted to make sure I was comfortable and familiar with the equipment I was gonna be using in the Antarctic before I ever got there. Uh, so I made a couple of dives there in the Beagle Channel and that water temperature was 36 degrees Fahrenheit and I'm wearing a dry suit with a uh, polar undergarment underneath. Uh, and then while in the Antarctic, they did have something called the polar plunge and the water there was 30 degrees. Uh, and there were people who were encouraged to, or given an opportunity opportunity to go swimming in that 30 degree water. Now you see that picture, you don't see me anywhere in that photograph because <laughs> I didn't do that. I didn't want to have a cardiac event out there in the Antarctic. Uh, hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. You want to make sure that you're well hydrated uh, before and after the dive. So the American College of Sports Medicine says 16 to 20 ounces of some proper hydrating liquid, uh, non-alcoholic, non-caffeinated uh, water, or I actually use Pedialyte uh, or Gatorade or something like that. 
and then 16 to 24 ounces after the dive to rehydrate. So rehydration is just as important uh, as hydration is. So it's the skin protection for uh, protect yourself from uh, skin sunburn uh, and damage to the skin, uh, an SPF factor of 30 or higher is good. Uh, and use sunscreen and sunblock liberally. Uh, you wanna make sure that you do that to protect your skin. And also it's a good idea to use uh, some sort of sunscreen that and sun, sun lent, suntan lotion that is uh, reef protective uh, to make sure that it's not gonna harm the reefs and the places where you dive. Uh, alcohol consumption, I uh, need to do that in moderation and watch your drug intake. And that uh, illustration on the side there says, after reading about negative effects of drinking, I've decided to stop reading. <laughs> but you have to understand that uh, drinking alcohol, your body then has to break down those waste products and once the waste products are broken down, it has to rid itself of those waste products. So it takes time to break down the alcohol, takes time to break down the waste products, takes time to rid uh, your body of those waste products. And those things are a lot slower uh, as you get older. Uh, use mask clear solutions if necessary uh, to make sure your mask is clear. So your stomach, intestines, and your bladder, alterations in digestive and urinary tract function as you age, decrease the liver production that we talked about before, Increased time for your kidneys to rid the body of waste, as we talked about, takes time to break down that uh, alcohol or those drugs, takes time to waste to remove those waste products, take time uh, for those products to remove from the body. Um, metabolizing drugs and alcohol, again, takes time and it takes longer time as you age, and it takes time to remove those other intoxicants. Uh, when you're talking about uh, dehydration, uh, you can see that it does affect performance. Uh, when you look at dehydration in the top there, it says there could be an 8 to 10 percent decrement in performance. That, of course, is critical from a diving safety standpoint. Diving safety standpoint. It's critical from being a, uh, an effective buddy standpoint if you are um, reduced in your ability to perform uh, your diving skills. Uh, as far as the way it affects the heart, it reduces your stroke volume, it reduces cardiac output, which also affects your body's ability uh, to rid itself of the gases that have been uh, built up during the dive. And then as far as your muscles are concerned, less oxygen is getting to your muscles. And because of an electrolyte imbalance, it can cause cramping, uh, which can be a very, very serious issue from a diving safety standpoint. So your bladder capacity decreases as you age. Your aim may not get any better either. Uh, urination frequency increases as well. We all know that is a fact of growing older. Uh, you have to watch what you eat as far as diving considerations are concerned. I don't know why anybody would ever eat that. My, uh, my wife one time when we were down in Panama City, Florida, uh, actually put a can of pork brains and milk gravy in my lunch. Uh, and so when I got out to the dive site and pulled it out of my lunch bag, uh, everybody ran for the railing. <laughs> I mean, it was terribly nasty stuff. So I decided actually to take it down uh, underwater on a dive because normally if you have any kind of food down there, uh, the fish will go crazy. So I was down on the wreck and there were fish all around. I opened the can and the fish disappeared. Even the fish wouldn't eat it. <laughs> so make sure that you know what you eat uh, and make sure your stomach can handle the things that you eat. Uh, food could affect your performance during a dive. Uh, this photograph on the right-hand side, um, my diving partners and I were diving in Saba and uh, we'd had a very good breakfast that morning and we were talking about the dive up on the dive deck. And then I have a habit of doing a safety stop actually on the descent about 10 or 15 feet below the surface just to make sure everything is the way it should be before we continue our descent to the bottom. And when I ask everybody if they're okay, one of the divers said he was okay. The other diver actually put his hand on his stomach and he was not okay. Uh, so we ended up having to uh, watch that diver. We took him back up to the surface, made sure he got out of the water, back onto the boat uh, before my buddy and I continued uh, our dive. So to pee or not to pee in your wetsuit, that's a personal consideration. You have to decide whether you want to do that or not. Uh, alterations in your ability to metabolize drugs, that is a fact of growing older. It does take a longer time for your body to metabolize and rid itself of the waste products of drugs. Uh, what accommodations can be made? Uh, avoid exotic foods, foods that you've not eaten before, foods your stomach is not used to, uh, can seriously affect your ability to dive and enjoy the dive. Uh, hydrate, hydrate, hydrate as much as you can pre-dive and post-dive uh, to make sure that you are well hydrated. Uh, and I personally have a preference for dive boats that have a head on board uh, because that way I don't have to worry about peeing in my wetsuit or my dry suit. Uh, and I, I prefer to have that. That's a personal choice as well. 
And then reasonable alcohol consumption, uh, because, you know, the diving is a social activity and a lot of social activities take place around the bar, uh, but make sure that you're reasonable about your alcohol consumption. So diving activities should match your levels of fitness, your mobility and strength, uh, your swimming and fitting ability, because you want to make sure that you're able to enjoy the dive without having to work too hard. And of course, work workload is directly related uh, to the fact that your body is, is doing more work, is ventilating more gas, you're uh, building up uh, more waste products, and therefore that can affect your diving safety. Now, fitness considerations for older divers. Remember, the suggestion that I hear from most medical authorities now is that divers should have an annual physical after the age of 45 and should have a periodic uh, cardiac stress tests. Since cardiac incidents are a third or more of the diving fatalities, it makes perfect sense to make sure that you are in good cardiac health and that you do have a periodic cardiac stress test. I don't know if that should be done annually or every two years or three years. It really is uh, up uh, to you and your physician or your medical authority. Uh, there's a photograph of Steven Tyler from Aerosmith, who is 74 years old, and uh, he dives uh, regularly as well. Uh, also, uh, it's a good idea to have a physical anytime there's any noticeable changes in your health. So if you notice that there's something going on where you don't feel well or something uh, that uh, doesn't feel like it should, uh, then therefore it's probably not a bad idea to get an annual physical. In fact, I just had one myself just a couple of days ago. Uh, visit a diving medical professional who understands your life priorities. So, and I do have life, your life priorities in yellow because I think it's very important that your physician understands how important the sport is to you. That should not supersede that physician's good medical advice. But on the other hand, there are some physicians who would simply say, because they are not familiar with diving medicine, they may simply say that, well, you should stop diving. Uh, and there are people that I've heard who uh, have been told when they reach a certain age, you should stop diving. And that's not based on any uh, medical information or any research. It's simply that person's uh, suggestion because they're unfamiliar uh, with, with diving and how important it is to us. So it's a good idea that the physician that you're dealing with understands that diving is very important to you. But again, it should not supersede good medical advice. And also don't forget that Dan and uh, Divers Alert Network does have a physician referral network that has over 700 physicians all around the country in all specialties that you can be referred to if you want to talk to somebody who truly is familiar with diving medicine. Or you could have your physician contact Divers Alert Network and the Dan Medical Department can talk to your physician and give your physician information that'll help your physician make the appropriate decisions relative to your health. Older divers should adhere to safety and conservative practices. I tend to be even more conservative the older I grow. Um, and that photo, I, I love a lot of error. <laughs> I would love to have that much air during a dive, even though it would create a lot of drag and cause a lot of uh, workload as far as your dive is concerned. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and dive more and worry less. So when you're underwater, some of those cares actually disappear with your bubbles. Uh, so diving is very therapeutic from a stress relief point of view. Uh, but make sure that you understand that you dive within your limits and experience and dive your recent experience, not your certification card. And this is a photo taken on a trip I had to Socorro where uh, it was one of those days when there was quite a bit of wind blowing. There was some six to eight foot seas in certain areas. So my partner and I decided, well, no, we'll just sit this one out. Uh, so you can uh, decide not to dive if you feel for some reason or other it, it may uh, put some stress on your diving ability. So avoid diving in conditions that may exceed your recent experience uh, or your current uh, abilities. Uh, I also suggest for older divers to use nitrox blends with your dive computer set on the air setting. So the dive computer I have does have a nitrox setting, but I don't change it and have not changed it away from air. Um, and also if you're using dive tables to use the air tables uh, with the nitrox blend, because what that will do, that will give you a little bit of safety factor, but you have to understand how nitrox works and the limitations for using nitrox. And nitrox is not a deep diving gas. So you do have some depth limitations uh, when you're using a nitrox blend. But uh, my suggestion is that nitrox is something that's good for older divers. In fact, it's so frequently used by older divers that it's been nicknamed geezer gas. <laughs> And they can call it geezer gas all they want, but I'm still going to use it because I think it's a safe thing to do. So older divers should use the most conservative options. Practice slow ascents, including safety stops. 
be situationally aware because being situational aware means that if you worked harder during the dive, harder than expected, one thing you can do is lengthen your safety stop, or you could dive shallower, or there are things you can do, but you have to be situationally aware to be able to make those decisions. Carry safety and signaling equipment, for example, like uh, surface signaling kits, the one that I have there on the left-hand side, uh, it is the Dan Surface Signaling Kit. That was one that I helped develop when I was there. Uh, it is unique because not only its size, uh, but it's unique because it does have a metallic strip, uh, which is visible on radar. And as far as I know, no other Surface Signaling Kit or Surface Marker buoy has that. Uh, also, you may want to use a Surface Float if necessary. And something else to consider is some sort of electronic device. This is a Nautilus Lifeline. I don't work for Nautilus. I don't get anything from promoting the use of the Nautilus Lifeline, but it is a device that if you are separated from your boat uh, and you need to get some assistance, you need to have somebody come and get you, uh, you come to the surface, you activate it, it sends a signal, uh, actually it sends a man overboard signal to vessels all within a certain number of miles from your position and it can actually help locate you within a meter. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, also, take a break after multiple days of diving and multiple dives per day. Older divers should not be afraid to ask for help. Uh, the boat you use should have an easy exit ladder with a pull-up bar to help you. And again, ask for help from the people on board. You can don and doff your equipment in the water if necessary. And don't be afraid to say no. Remember, anybody can call a dive at any time for any reason. That's one of the best safety uh, things you can possibly do. Just raise your thumb, the dive is over. I've actually done that actually before the dive even begins uh, because there was some reason why I felt I shouldn't be diving that day. So whenever you raise your thumb, that means the dive is over. That's one of the most important things I ever learned uh, in cave diving. So return to diving post COVID. Uh, I get a lot of questions about that. Uh, that's not my area of expertise. I'm not a physician, so I'm not going to give you any medical advice about that. But uh, there have been things written about that. Uh, and you need to have a physician familiar with diving medicine and your life priorities to give you advice about returning to dive post-COVID. And there was a great article <coughs> that was written by uh, the Dan Medical Department in the Alert Diver about returning to diving post-COVID and an article written by Dr. Doug Ebersol. In fact, I believe he did a presentation for, for this group uh, on return to diving post COVID because he actually had COVID and can give you some really good advice. And he's also uh, our speaker next month on February 8th. Did he really? Well, that's yes, great. He is. A great guy. Great guy. Uh, and also uh, regarding return to diving, but cautiously, that's an article I wrote for Dive Newswire uh, in the March 29th issue of 2021. Because again, your skills get rusty and some skills, especially the complex psychomotor skills, don't take long for those uh, to get rusty enough that you can't use them effectively. So continue to do your part, wear a mask. <laughs> and scuba diving is a sport that invented social distancing. So hopefully at some point in time in our life, COVID will be gone and it'll be just a bad memory. Uh, but right now we're dealing with it. So we have to deal with it as best we can. So the question is, can older people manage the physical and mental requirements associated with scuba diving? That's a dive in Guadalupe that I was on with Ernie Brooks when he celebrated his 85th birthday. Uh, and you probably all can you hear that, Ken? Can you hear that music? Okay, that's the music. Yeah, see, you got it. And uh, Zale Perry was Lloyd Bridges' co-star. And that's her. That's her. Over on the left-hand side in that photo, diving in Socorro with the giant Pacific manta rays. And Zale Perry is like uh, Sylvia Earle. She's ageless. And she is a very active diver at her ageless period of time. And then you have people like Pat Fung, uh, who was an instructor candidate at age 75 and became an active scuba instructor. And then you have Ray Woolley, who was at one time considered the world's oldest diver uh, active diver at age 96, but now he is only Europe's oldest diver because the oldest diver in, in the world is Bill Lambert. <coughs> Excuse me. And Bill Lambert is 100 years old. He started diving when he was 97. And the kind of diving he done is a, does is the kind of diving we do. So he puts his gear together uh, himself with the assistance of his buddy. He dives without somebody leading him and pulling him through the water. He swims through the water like a diver should and is actively enjoying diving at 100 years old. So, but there is one thing you're gonna to have to do at some point in time in your life and that's make a decision. 
And that decision is uh, when you have to hang up your fins. Uh, we don't want to think about that, but it's something we have to come to grips with at some point in time. And that decision should be made when diving is no longer fun, uh, when you feel that you may put yourself at risk or others at risk, uh, or when you can no longer conduct a self-rescue or assist in the rescue of a diving companion. So the decision to hang up your fins should be made with a physician's advice. And if a physician, again, is familiar with diving medicine and your life priorities and your overall health, and you really have to be realistic and have a realistic assessment of your capabilities uh, as a safe because you want to make sure you don't put yourself at risk or other people in the, you're in the water with uh, at risk. So when you cross that road, uh, you can cross it as a diver who has experience that can share those experiences with others, and you can be a mentor to other people. And everybody in this video bingo. is 80 years old or older. I am not shrinking. I'm not strong for my age. I'm strong. I will retire for the night. I will begin again tomorrow. I will always respect my elders. I am wrinkled and I am grand. Okay, if anybody would like a, a copy of that article I wrote for Dive Center Business, um, my email address is there. It's danor at danorconsulting.com, and I'll be happy to send you a copy of that article. Uh, also, my wife and I just recently published an ebook uh, that's available through wisedivers.com and on Amazon and Apple Books. It's 101 tips. And to give you a little tip, it's actually more than 101 tips, <laughs> because when they asked, uh, asked me to start writing this, um, for those that know me, uh, I very rarely can stop doing things. And so we actually came up with quite a few others, finally have it uh, down to a reasonable amount, but it is slightly over 101 tips. Uh, and then, of course, we have the book Scuba Diving Safety. And there are articles that I mentioned before that were published in Dive Newswire. And if you can't find those articles, again, send me an email. I'll be happy to share those articles with you. Uh, about uh, things that I think are very important in diving safety. So safety, safely enjoy, we all should safely enjoy diving, regardless of our age, as long as we're being realistic about our abilities and capabilities, uh, we can enjoy the diving for a long, long time. Thank you very much. And I'll hang around as long as people have questions. Very good. Uh, everybody can give Dan the silent round of applause. Dan, you can end the share screen if you would. That'll make us okay. all right. Let me do that. A little bit bigger. Uh, Should be up towards the top under the center of your screen. Okay, there. Higher up, I think. Okay. I don't know if I can kick you out of the share screen or not. Yeah, I think you may have to, but it's not giving. Yeah, I can. Hold on. There it is. There it is. There it is. There it is. I got it. See it. Okay. I got it. Okay. Um, okay. Just so you guys know, Dan was having some internet connection problems. So when he was starting to talk, he wasn't having a stroke. Hopefully, no one <laughs> called 911 or anything like that. <laughs> who has, yeah, who has, oh, we have a question from, from Kaz. He typed it in. How should an older diver be approached? That's a good question. How should an older diver be approached to let them know? when it's time to stop diving, yeah, obviously that... when some warning signs are not too great to notice. And just by the way, Kaz, I'm really offended by that question. I'm sure that's about me, but we'll deal with that <laughs> later on. Well, I will tell you, uh, I actually just finished an article today about that very subject. Um, it's, it's, it's really tough. Um, first of all, you have to be very compassionate because diving means a lot to all of us. Uh, it's part of who we are, and it's, it's not dissimilar from older people being told they can no longer drive a car. So one of the things you have to do is you have to look for warning signs, you know, where people are making repeated mistakes. And I do emphasize repeated because we all make mistakes, and uh, it doesn't mean that we have to stop diving. But uh, repeated mistakes, uh, generally very simple mistakes. Uh, people who are, are fumbling around with their equipment seem to be very nervous, um, very hesitant sometimes. Um, so whatever warning signs you see, it may be the point where you have to simply and do it privately 
pull the person away and say, you know, there, there are other things that you can do. Um, you don't necessarily have to give up the sport completely. So for example, one thing that I suggest as another step would be to do surface applied air diving like I do when I go to Guadalupe to see the great white sharks. Uh, because I generally make 25 or more cage dives um, with surface applied breathing gas while I'm underwater breathing like I would as a diver and enjoy being underwater. Um, you can do that. You can go snorkeling. You can, which I think is a very important thing for people to do, Older people, especially retired people, should have some sort of focus in their retirement years. So what you can do, you can actually volunteer with an instructor in the pool and work with students in the pool. So you're in the water wearing diving gear. You're not giving up the floor completely. But then you can be there to mentor people, to inspire people uh, to enjoy the sport you've enjoyed throughout your diving career. So it's a tough thing, <clears throat> but I would do it very, very pa compassionately uh, and privately. Kaz, if, if you call me now, I'm, I'm going to be worried. Um, and, I'll, and I'll be happy to share uh, that article if, if you send me an email. It cool. talks about that very thing. And, and by the way, anyone who's got a question, you can either use <clears throat> at the bottom of the screen the reactions and just raise your hand or physically raise your hand on camera and we'll, we'll get to you. But I'll, I'll share a story about one of our divers. Some of you may have dove with him, Alphonse Stetler, who's no longer, no longer alive, but he was started diving late in life and he was probably around 65 or so in very good health and called me one day and said, you know, I just made my thousandth dive over the weekend. He says, but I know I'm slowing down and I'm getting older and I think it's time I'm done. And he just made, made that decision on his own. So, you know, it, it is the type of thing, as, as Dan said, it's a tricky, it's a tricky subject. And, uh, you know, and it's one thing for any of you who are instructors or, or dive masters that you go through, not only in terms of, of age, but sometimes, you know, people are just having, having a bad day. On our Socorro trip a year ago, we had a guy who was just, who's dove with me a, a lot and he just was not having a good day one day. And we just said, uh, you know, you need to, you need to back off a day. And he, he took the advice well, and then we were able to put him with a dive master, but sometimes it happens. And again, it's not just an age thing. You know, yeah. there are all kinds of reasons for people not to do a dive on a given day. Yeah. I mean, I've made that decision a number of times where I simply called the dive because I just didn't feel well, didn't feel up to it. So I right. did well, just sit on the deck and watch other people or help other people. Cause a lot of times I'll be there just to help people get in and out of the water. Yep. And, and as many of you have heard me say, one of my favorite sayings, and Dan, if you've never heard this, feel free to steal it. You never <laughs> get hurt on a dive. You don't make. <laughs> Absolutely true. Yeah. Who else has a question? Glenn. Unmute, Glenn. So um, I noticed in my, as I'm aging, that one thing you didn't mention was my balance is affected. And I tend to do uh, liveaboards and it, you know, you're rocking and it's, yeah, and, and travel, you know, to and from the, the dinghy. Yeah. And I noticed my balance is. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I did mention that briefly, but you're absolutely right, because that's one of the big issues. In fact, when you there are a lot of places now where you go to get your hearing checked and your balance checked at the same time uh, because of the aging population. And that's one reason why, uh, again, telling your buddy that you may have some difficulty and your buddy can help you or the people who are there, dive masters or assistants on the boat can help you get from one place to the next. And sometimes I'll also strategically place my equipment so I don't have that long walk back to the entry point. So that way, all I've got to do is get up, take maybe one step with the help of someone else, and then get into the water. And that pull-up bar is very important when you're getting back up on the boat. So that's a very important thing. Thank you for bringing that up. Very good. Stacy Carr, you got your hand up. You're up. Hey. hey oh, Stacey. funky lighting. Sorry, everybody. That's okay. Uh, we'll let it go. Thanks, Ken. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering, my dive buddy um, is taking a medication that compromises his immunity. And um, we're going to, to Egypt in March. And I'm just wondering if there are any um, precautionary measures or anything you can think of 
um, Dan, that would be advisable for us? Yeah, what I would do is I would call the medical department of Dan uh, and tell them or have, have him or her um, call the medical department and tell them what medication they're taking. And what they can do is they can either do a literature search or they may already know the effect that medication would have on diving. Uh, okay. And I think they'll do is they'll ask for whatever the underlying medical issue that causes that person to have to have to use that medication. Uh, but right. they're probably the best source. Uh, because they have access to all of that information. So I would definitely call them. And anybody, whether you remember or not, can call them uh, between nine and five, Monday through Friday. And they are indeed the medical authority. All right. Thank you so much. And if they don't know the answer, they will get back to you. They will. So they'll be sure about that. What else we got? Carol was just scratching her head. At first, I thought it was a question. <laughs> Come on, two questions. That's all we got today. Yep. All right. I mean, Let's make sure it. that you make sure you write down my email address because if you have a question anytime, send me an email. I mean, I'm always always available. Uh, I do travel quite a bit, so it may take a day or two to get back to you, but um, I'll be happy to help you if you have any situation or any question whatsoever. I can direct you direct you to the right place. And if you guys forget Dan's email, you can certainly email me, yep. and I'll I'll send you his. I, I give you his email. I can give you his home address. Cell phone. <laughs> I got a couple of the bank account numbers. If you're a little short on cash, there may be too much, maybe too yeah. much information. Yeah, and, 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 and you need to change those passwords as well, Dan. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> oh, Glenn, you got another question? Um, I just, uh, you mentioned that you're traveling a lot. Um, I'm a little hesitant to travel because of the COVID. Um, what are your takes on personal travel? Well, I've done last year, I did um, a trip to Africa that lasted about three weeks. I had to take seven COVID tests uh, during that time. Um, and five of them were PCR tests and two of them were the rapid antigen tests. Um, but I'm just very, very cautious. My wife and I both are very, very cautious. Um, and we want to make sure, which we are fully immunized and taking the booster shot and everything. Um, and we just to make sure that um, we use whatever social distancing we can. We try to make sure that uh, there's no one sitting right next to us on the plane. We make sure we're wearing a mask, uh, the appropriate type of mask. And, and we've been very, very fortunate, um, but there are, it's, it's a risk. Uh, and it's a risk that you've got to be willing to take if you want to travel. And this year I've got a, supposedly a trip to Tasmania. Uh, we've got a trip to Alaska and um, a couple of trips to Mexico and, few other places, but we're just trying to, we, we want to make sure that, that COVID doesn't ruin our life. Um, and, and so uh, we're just trying to be as cautious as we possibly can. It's a, you're right. It's a hard balance, Glenn, between, yes, it really is. you know, do you want to stay inside all day? Cause I guarantee if you stay in your house all day long, you know, and don't have anybody in, you're not going to get COVID, uh, but you <laughs> probably won't be very happy. So <laughs> where, where's, where's that balance? Somebody Mr. Else has Mr. Gronick. Yes, thanks, Ken. Um, one one question. A lot of us, um, especially those that are photographers, go solo diving. We we don't pair up with a buddy. So, uh, and and I don't know if anybody else wanted to ask that. But at what point? At what age do you say I, I can't do that anymore? <laughs> uh, well, that's a good. That's that's a decision you're going to have to make. Um, I mean, I. I'm a photographer. I'm not a professional photographer by any stretch of imagination, um, but I, I personally find it hard not to dive with a companion. Um, but I've been on dives. I was on a dive uh, to Socorro a couple of years ago where I was the only non-professional photographer on that trip. And once people were in the water, it was every man for himself. Uh, and it was, it was difficult because I wanted to be with a companion and I had even talked to someone and they said they would be my buddy during the dive. Um, but in cases like that, I always make sure now that if something like that happens, I have a redundant breathing gas supply with me, uh, because I want to make sure that I, I can handle things independently. I don't like to dive independently. Um, even though I've been diving for 50 years, I, I don't like diving independently. I like diving. I like sharing the dive with a companion. Uh, but I have, I'll either use a spare air, I'll use a pony bottle. So just in case I end up by myself, I'm able to 
Well, I normally, if I ended up by myself, I'll abort the dive. <laughs> um, and so I just, my, my particular feeling is I like having somebody with me. Dan, I, I think we need to get you an emotional support fish. <laughs> that would be perfect. You'll always have a buddy right, right there. And actually it could be a puffer fish. And if it he stays be. puffed up, he's got an air supply right there. Something like uh, auto the auto buddy. There you go. Perfect. Um, and, you know, because I, I mean, I've got to make sure I'm capable of doing a self-rescue if I have to. So, but again, that decision is a decision you're going to have to make for yourself. Uh, at what point in time do you feel there needs to be somebody nearby in case there's an issue? Thank you. Any yeah. other questions? Going once. Going. <laughs> oh, Wendy's got a question. Got him right <laughs> under the wire there, Wendy. All right. <laughs> Wendy, get a little, a little closer because we can't exactly hear you. My favorite place to dive is Fiji. But I've been, other than the pandemic, a bit reluctant to go there because Fiji hasn't had an operating chamber in God knows how long, all the times I've ever been there probably. And we keep asking and they say, oh, they put one in, but they haven't staffed it yet or they haven't figured out the electrical connections or whatever. Um, how do you feel about diving in a major dive destination where the nearest chamber is a four hour airplane ride away? Yeah, that, that is actually gets more and more realistic uh, as time goes on because divers are trying to get to remote places, get to some of the, the unspoiled dive spots. And sometimes it takes two or three days. Like for example, when I was diving in the Antarctic, when I was diving in the Antarctic in 2018, there's no way in the world that if somebody would have gotten bent or embolized, they could have gotten to a chamber in less than two or three days. Um, and so therefore, if I'm in a situation like that and I, I will go to those places, I will be ultra conservative. Um, and so, for example, I, I haven't breathed air in a long time. I breathe nitrox on every dive I make. Um, and I, in fact, when we go to the Antarctic, no dives are done deeper than 60 feet. Um, no, nobody dies more than twice a day. Uh, there's at least a two to three hour surface interval between dives. So we're, and it doesn't mean that you're going to be totally free of the possibility of an accident, but you reduce the likelihood. And so when I'm diving in a situation where there is no chamber anywhere nearby, uh, or it would take days and days to get me there, uh, then I'll be as conservative as I possibly can if I want to dive there. But again, like other things, it's a decision you'll have to make. Um, and, and also, it, you don't, if you're in a situation where you have to really restrict your dive to be that conservative, is it really worth going there? Uh, and I do. I, I'll go to places where I only sometimes make one dive a day. So it really kind of all depends on how much risk you're willing to assume. And again, I tend to be one of the more conservative divers there is and sometimes very boring. <laughs> that's um, okay. I want to, I want to make sure I enjoy the dive as much as I can. And to me, that's a very shallow, relatively long dive, uh, and not doing a whole lot of dives a day. I mean, when I was on a liveaboard a while back, they said, you know, we will give you the opportunity to do five dives a day. There's no way in the world I'm going to make five dives a day. I could, but I think that's, uh, the risk is too high for me. Any other questions? All righty. Once again. Well, thank you all very much. You give Dan a round I appreciate of applause. it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and and, and, and have by the a very way, safe and healthy 2022. Oh, and Rex, Rex. Oh, that's clapping hands. Oh, that's all. I keep forgetting the clapping hands are there. Um, and as Dan mentioned, by the way, with sometimes chamber issues around the world, and since Carl's sitting here, just a good time to remind you, Chamber Day will be May 4th this year. We'll go live on May 1st and try to beat you up for all the money that you have. And also don't forget the Avalon Underwater Cleanup on February 26th, which is also a fundraiser for the Catalina Hyperbaric Chamber. Next month on- Can I uh, correct you? For what, what, Carl? You said we'll be go, going live May 1st. It's March 1st. Oh, I'm sorry, March 1st. Well, you know, I'm probably bent. Let me get it. Let me get a boat over to the island. And you, can, <laughs> you can treat me here. Um, yes, we go live March 1st, um, but May 4th is, is the date. Uh, next month, February the 8th, second Tuesday of February, uh, it will be, as we mentioned earlier, Dr. Doug uh, Ebersole, uh, who's sort of doing a follow-up. What have we learned about COVID 
in the last year uh, and, and stuff like that. Um, as many of you know, I, I'm now a member of the COVID club and actually over the weekend hit my 90th day. So the aquarium rule is 90 days out. I got my physical scheduled for Thursday and I'm looking to get back into that diving. But again, there's a lot of different, different things going on. So I think that's going to be a, a good one. And then it's information that's changing, changing all the time. Every day, it seems we learn, learn something new or, or learn something we didn't know. So anyhow, Dan, thank you again. Uh, Take care, as, everybody. As always, a pleasure, a pleasure to have you here. And, uh, you know, who knows? He's done the last two January. So maybe we'll make January Dan or month and he'll be back next January with another with another talk. So thank you all very much for spending some time with us here on Zoom Seekers. I uh, bid you a fond farewell. Wave goodbye. And as usual, do my favorite thing, which is hit the button that says end meeting for all.